In 2023, generative AI became headline news and it continues to do so. For some marketers, it's been a real game changer, but for others, it's brought up questions regarding data safety and how to stand out, with many trying to balance safety and performance. I'm Helen Muzzard, CMO of IB Europe, the European Association for the Digital Advertising and Marketing Ecosystem. In this third and final episode of Talking AI, I'll be joined by two incredible guests where we will be discussing how generative AI is shaping and impacting the digital advertising industry. So a big welcome to Pallavi and Guy. I'm delighted to have you both here. Uh, Guy, did you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, sure thing. Thanks for having me, Helen. My name is Guy Gobert-Jones. I am a managing partner at Omnicom Media Group, uh, in the UK, and I look after our search and performance functions. Amazing. And Pallavi. Hi, everyone. I'm Pallavi. I lead um, our creative tools in Google Ads. I'm a group product manager. So let's kick off. Um, Pallavi, we're already seeing incredible examples of what brands and marketers are doing with generative AI from the likes of Coca-Cola. I'll put my own team in there as well, because we've been experimenting for about 12 months now, and we are making so many new developments, saving so many more, so much time when it comes to producing assets and copy, of course, for our social and newsletter. Um, how transformative do you see it being at the moment? Like how are marketers using it on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, well, um, as I mentioned, I lead our creative tool development in Google Ads, um, and we, help, we work on, on helping advertisers across the creative life cycle develop creative, run creative, optimize their creative. And so when Gen AI came on the scene, um, it was such a great fit for what we were trying to do and what we were trying to help advertisers with. Um, and um, it's still very early days, but we're seeing a lot of uptick, both um, with the tools that we developed last year and launched, um, and also through Google's own marketing team using solutions such as automatically created assets to generate text and um, text headlines and descriptions, um, as well as the tools that we launched in Performance Max to generate images and also text um, to run, uh, to create assets and run them across Google's inventory. Compared to the hype that we're reading, we're seeing at the moment, you know, like you would, you would think that brands are kind of doing everything now with generative AI. Is, is that true? And are you seeing it living up to the hype that's out there? The way I think about it is I look back sort of like 10 years ago, right? And that's when Google first started launching some of their predictive AI models, which I see as the sort of precursor to all of this. And they were released with much less fanfare than Gen AI was. It was, you know, much more back office, but it was properly transformational to how anyone using Google Ads at that time, you know, did live their lives and did their jobs. Because prior to smart bidding, you had to spend hours of your day manually changing keyword bids. After smart bidding, that was a thing of the past. You had a really intelligent AI that was picking auction level bids based on the top level strategies and goals and creative that you were setting. So I see Gen AI, particularly within the Google ecosystem, as the next step on top of that predictive modeling and, and you know, bringing to particularly, you know, to Pallavi's point, the, to the world of creative, that sort of like sense of auction specific generation of creative that Gen AI can be doing um, as an extra thing that you do on top of your predictive modeling to control all your bidding to make it, you know, your, your whole ecosystem even more powerful uh, and even more sort of like automated towards driving performance, which ultimately is what our clients want to do, right? Uh, like, you know, we can talk for ages about, you know, how is it transforming jobs? But if it's not delivering better results for our clients, it's a very difficult conversation to have. And Pallavi, I thought that's, you know, great for Guy to talk about the early days and, and how predictive AI has worked. Um, what's your thoughts on that? In the early days of smart bidding, there were a lot of um, questions around how is, um, you know, smart bidding going to change the role of an advertiser and, and what are advertisers going to do um, with smart bidding on the scene. And I think, you know, we all found out that um, there were still plenty of things for people to do, even as we automate smart bidding. Um, and we're getting lots of questions as well on, on creative and these Gen AI tools um, as they, you know, as Gen AI automates a number of, um, um, a number of activities that we were doing with creative, 
um, what is the role of the marketer. Um, and so I think what we'll find is that there will be lots of things for people to do. Um, uh, and, and these tools will just make us faster, more efficient and, and allow us to do more, especially in that area of personalization and um, really developing lots of variety of, of copy and images tailored to various audiences and then building that into the predictive modeling as you were talking about so that we can really tailor the right ad to the right, um, the right audience. Um, and so we're already seeing some of this being unlocked with some of our offerings like automatically created assets, which pairs generative text, as well as that um, smart bidding capability and automation um, together. Um, and I think we'll see more of that throughout, throughout various types of um, ads uh, in 2024. Pallavi, you've talked there about efficiency and about time being saved. How much time on average do you think it is saving the likes of me, other marketeers in our day to day? Is there actually any evidence behind this? We're getting uh, reports from our advertisers about the time savings that it's providing them and um, the efficiency of being able to create um, uh, and scale out their asset strategy. Um, and there was a recent Salesforce study um, saying that advertisers are spending, marketers are spending, um, saving five hours a week, which adds up to a whopping one month a year um, uh, on average. And so that's very exciting. So we've talked all about the wonderful benefits that, you know, we can all clearly see. And um, I, I, I think Pallavi Guy, you've already hinted at it, you know, the other side, brand safety. Guy, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, what what are the concerns that you're hearing from the the partners, the brands that you're working with, when it comes to them using um, Gen AI? And is there anything that the likes of Google and Pallavi and her team could be doing, uh, developing to help you go back and fulfil, you know, the questions that your, these brands may have. So what we need to make sure is that, you know, as we're developing Gen AI that, you know, brings performance and creative closer together, we're not losing out on that human storytelling side of things. Because this is what clients, I think, are really concerned about. They're concerned that, A, you know, the Gen AI is maybe not understanding, you know, brand guidelines as well as a person would and is creating maybe an asset that they wouldn't want live. But also, B, they spend so much of their, you know, time thinking about, you know, their huge YouTube ads or their huge TV ads that tell a really compelling story that feels very human, how can you translate that style of advertising into something that is much more scalable for different people with different experiences, you know, representing different communities that you should hopefully be able to be, be able to do with Gen, a, Gen AI, but should still feel like it has that human core to it. I think that's what we're all sort of exploring at the moment and trying to work our way through. And certainly I think Google's working on some really exciting stuff to help us, you know, get there. So Pallavi, um, I'm really interested to find out how do brands create and find that balance between driving innovation and creativity, but also maintaining and building on their brand safety and transparency to stakeholders and to their consumers? Well, it, you do have to come to the table with your own ideas and your brand, and you have to incorporate that into how you're using these tools. Um, I, uh, I like to think about it in terms of um, you know, the, the move from uh, film cameras to digital cameras. And I'm personally a hobbyist photographer. I've actually um, spent a fair amount of time um, learning photography. And I think that digital cameras brought, you know, the art of taking a photo to a huge array of, of folks. And now we have more people than ever um, um, taking pictures and incorporating photography into their daily lives. But the the art of taking a picture and um, the need for creativity has not gone away. And um, you still need that creative eye in order to stand out. And I think that we'll see that as true when it comes to generative creative tools and how brands distinguish themselves through their bringing their brand to the table and continuing to bring creativity to the table. Creativity is still as important as ever um, in, um, in building out your ads. The second piece on brand suitability, we're investing in more ways to, um, to allow you to provide um, seeds to the AI 
um, but also get transparent reporting um, on these variations that the AI is creating so that you can continue to ensure and, and control the AI and ensure that those variations are on brand. So when it comes to um, showing the consumer that the, the, you know they are the, the end user there, any of the advertising, what transparency controls do you have in place to help Guy maybe reassure his clients that you know the consumer is not going to be tricked or fooled? They we have certain mechanisms um, in place to, to convey this. Um, well, first, all our ads go through all of our standard ad review policies to check for um, trademark violations and um, a host of other um, a host of other checks to ensure that um, when advert you know when when an advertiser um, runs ads, those are faithfully representing um, you know what they're selling and um, are uh, conforming to our um, our advertising policies. Um, in addition to that, we are also committed to um, upholding our principles for developing generative AI tools. And as part of that, um, all of our generated images contain two forms of um, identification. The first is metadata, and the second is a, a digital watermark that's um, imperceptible to um, the human eye, but can help um, identify uh, synthetic content. So any image generated in Google Ads will have both. Um, so on that, I think we're going to pause because um, I have a really exciting game for us to play. And um, this is, let think about this like a Turing style test. So a bit like where we are talking about balance earlier on, one of the things that um, we'd love to do in this series is place AI against human. Not that either should be the clear winner, but I'm just going to ask you. So we've we've tested in the past. We've looked at songs, and um, today we're actually going to be looking at board games. And I just want you to tell me whether just if it's AI or human. So the first one is called Underwater Architects. Now this is the descriptions. Uh, so Underwater Architects: a race to create your own vibrant underwater seascape by building reef zones and overcoming environmental threats. I think that sounds like classic real board game to me. Okay, Guy, uh, tell me mm. what do you think? I'm going to say AI. You are absolutely spot on. That is AI. Okay, oh, on to the next no. one. Yeah, here we go. Um, Twilight Struggle. This is a game themed around the Cold War where players must contest each other's world influence with cards corresponding to different historical events. I'm going to go with human. Um, I'm, I'm back in, back in Parla She was right last time. Human, got to be. Okay, completely spot on that. Yep, that is human. <laughs> and then on to our last one. So this is called Life on the Farm, and it's where you race against each other to be the first to retire from your own family farm, managing budgets and livestock levels along the way. Is that AI or human? I think AI. I'm going to guess AI. Oh, you two. This is, I, I want to find out how popular this is. This is human. Oh, oh. sounds quite interesting. Thank you so much, guys, for playing that game. That was super fun. Now, just before we go, um, Pallavi, it would be great to hear about what is next for Gen AI, uh, especially around PMAX. Yeah, I think, um, well, first, we launched in the US this year and we'll be launching globally um, throughout the beginning of 2024. Um, we're investing in more ways for you to use your own products and your own brand guidelines, as I said, to, um, to seed the AI and use that um, uh, in AI development. Um, and so those are two um, major investments. And then we're going to continue to invest in transparency and control mechanisms um, to um, help our advertisers trust the AI that we are uh, creating and running um, ads and assets that are on brand and true to a, to their um, to to their brand and and what they're um, what they're selling. Thank you so much, Pallavi, for that whistle stop tour of generative AI. 
And thank you to Guy for sharing how it's going in practice with your clients. So this may be our last episode, but you can check out our previous episodes on large language models in broad match and predictive AI in bidding. Head to the Google Marketing Platform Academy website to listen now. And if you'd like to hear more from IB and Google, check out The Crux, which is a series my colleague and CMO of IB UK, James Chandler, is now working on. You can listen to it on the IB UK podcast, which is available on Spotify or the Google podcast and more. Pallavi and Guy, um, it's been great to have you both here today. I uh, really appreciate speaking to me in this final episode. So thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.